is 1700. The uneasy and fragile tension between the powers of Europe is about to be violently shattered. That same year, Russia, Poland, Lithuania, and Denmark would declare war on Sweden, kicking off the Great Northern War. A war that would show the world who the dominant power of Northern Europe truly was. Would it be the century of Sweden or the century of Russia? The War of the Spanish Secession would also, arguably, begin that same year, starting a 13-year-long conflict that would span across almost all of Western Europe, and would be, up to that point, the deadliest war in Europe since the Thirty Years' War. All the while, ruthless bands of colonial pirates would terrorize the Caribbean and the Atlantic, and the northern African Barbary nations of Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli, as well as the Moroccan Kingdom, would all make large bounties off of raiding vital trade routes in the Mediterranean Sea. The once large and cumbersome muskets have become smaller and lighter, and are now more common to see carried by soldiers than ever before. The bayonet has replaced the sword, and bright and colorful uniforms are the new standard of any civilized army. The long-lived age of pike and shot has come to a close, and the turn of a century brings on a new chapter to warfare. This is the starting premise of the Creative Assembly title, Empire Total War. The fifth mainline game of the Total War series, Empire Total War allows you to politically, economically, and militarily take control of a colonial era nation from the year 1700 all the way up to the year 1899. And with the recent release of Rome Total War Remastered, I felt like it was a good time to talk about why Empire is one of the best games to be released with the Total War name attached to it. While I do admit that games like Shogun 2 and the Warhammer titles are overall both better refined and polished than Empire, I still prefer Empire over those games, partially because of how much I love the colonial era of history, and partially because of how unique Empire is in comparison to Shogun and Warhammer. After all, there are countless samurai and fantasy games. There's a surprising lack of games that take place during the 18th century, much less RTS games, which only adds to my appreciation for Empire. But am I here to suck up, or am I here to tell you about the game? With introductions out of the way, let's dive right into Empire Total War. What's the most important aspect of any RTS game? The world map, of course. After all, you need a world to exist for battles to be fought in, and for diplomacy to be practiced in. The Total War series is well known for having grand scale and engaging overworld maps. Sometimes these maps range in the scale of a single country, like Japan, China, or the British Isles. Sometimes they scale an entire continent, like Europe. But Empire takes this a large step forward. After all, this is the colonial era we're talking about, an era of colonization and proto-world wars. It'd be criminal to limit such a time period to only Europe or only America. If we can fit three continents into Medieval 2, surely we can fit three into Empire. And fit they did, with room for even more. Empire contains two entire continents, Europe, including Anatolia and the Caucasus, and North America. The northern sections of two continents, South America and Africa, and several subcontinents, India, the Middle East, and the Bahamas. It's also possible for fleets to visit the coasts of West Africa, Eastern South America, Indonesia, and a couple others. To date, this is the largest Total War map in terms of scale, and as the game progresses and the top powers begin to grab more land across these continents, the scale of war and need for influence grows and grows, as the player and the CPUs have to manage fighting one another on multiple fronts across several continents, both at land and sea. Such wars are not for the faintest of nations, however. An intercontinental war can drain a treasury and a manpower pool quickly without the proper management. Empire's large scale not only acts as both a harbinger of good graphics and as a selling point, but an even more crucial need for decisive and wise strategic thought, and the loss of a single battle long distances away may cost you an entire theater of war. But what exactly is at stake to begin with? The overworld map is more than just an overlay for your armies to march across. The names of locations, roads, and overseas trade routes can all be seen on each continent. In Europe, Western architecture can be seen from France all the way to Siberia. Smithies and looms, as well as wheat farms and plantations, reflect the ever-growing importance of European industry as it meshes together with the farmland lived on since the days of Rome. Though your economy may start as small as your industry, its potential is almost explosive. In India, 
a more eastern and oriental style reflects the wise and aging nations of old. Industry is sparse, and limited mostly to textiles, but exotic agriculture and valuable metals clutter the subcontinent. If you're a smart trader, you can make a fortune off the western powers without ever even fighting a battle. And in America, New France, vice royalties, and the 13 colonies bring the modern lifestyles of Europe to a new world, as it contests with the traditional nations of the natives, an evolving modern economy bordering next to a threatened people desperate to survive. This need is further illustrated by the monuments of deities as old as written history, and aggressive ambush tactics that render gunpowder feeble. Each continent has a varying number of provinces within them. Within these provinces, there are capitals, and surrounding those capitals, there are towns. Your capitals are military hubs, your armies are raised here, regiment by regiment, and battery by battery. Your towns are your economic hubs and centers of learning. Farms and industry supply your provinces with monetary growth, and supply your nation with a coin to fund your armies to conquer more provinces. This hybrid between centralized and decentralized economies provides room for economic customization between provinces as you set newly built towns along a specific upgrade tree. It provides more points on a map to garrison your troops to defend against attacks. A regiment and treasury aren't all you'll need. After all, if your army uses outdated tactics and equipment, and your economic know-how remains stagnant, your nation will be partitioned by ambitious neighbors, and your economy will be antiquated. You need schools. Your schools are responsible for researching technology, and your nation's intellectuals can help speed up this process if you let them. And even if you can't build your own schools, there's always learning abroad. Keep on par with your peers, or even get ahead of them, and they might think twice before they strike. But what if you're the one to strike first? It's often said, a good craftsman is familiar with his tools. The same is true with any would-be general or admiral. If you want any chance of prevailing over your foes, you need to know how to properly fight them. No shit. You have relative to what they have. Let's discuss combat on land, before combat on the sea. There are three categories of units you can recruit. Infantry, cavalry, and artillery. Your infantry will likely make up the backbone of any army you raise. Infantry come in two types, range, and melee. From continent to continent, nations will prioritize one of these over the other for multiple reasons, such as their skill and availability. In Europe, musket and infantry are near the universal standard, line infantry specifically. Though coveted skirmish and ranger units are also a common sight, these units are much smaller than line infantry and more expensive. Early on in the game, pikemen are an occasional sight in European armies, though they tend to fizzle out quickly. They may be good for halting a cavalry charge or two, don't expect a pikeman to fire back at musketeers, or hold their own for long in a brawl. In eastern nations, melee and ranged units tend to work hand in hand. However, elite melee units that can easily break line infantry are a common sight to see in eastern armies as the game progresses, and are a very dangerous obstacle for western and eastern armies alike. And when paired with large regiments and musketeers, it can be deadly to an entire army. These massive armies, though costly to maintain, can provide excellent defense for Indian nations, and even just one or two of them can halt any western incursion. And in the Americas, native nations will rely almost exclusively on quick and mobile native warriors that you won't see coming until they're almost right on top of you. And the more elite units, such as the medicine men, can tear entire regiments to bits in minutes. While gunpowder may be the standard of western armies, it's probably best not to underestimate the skilled traditions of a more classical era of warfare. Hard to detect, and hard to counter, native armies make the idea of manifest destiny sound more like a slough than a conquest. If infantry are the backbone of any army and empire, then cavalry is the muscle. Like infantry, cavalry can be ranged or melee. Regiments of horse, cuirassars, hussars, and household cavalry are fine melee options, while dragoons, carabiners, and horse archers make for good ranged options. The cavalry can serve a variety of functions on the battlefield, exposing hidden enemy detachments in the foliage through reconnaissance missions, dismounting upon hills or walls to hold off an enemy while large portions of your armies maneuver themselves, counterattacking the enemy's own cavalry movements, or more morbidly, running down surviving units from any other armies as they try to flee. Mobile, versatile, and very quick, cavalry serves as an essential part for a proper army. Be sure not to abuse them, however, while good for a downhill charge or a few screening volleys, 
detachment of cavalry can be quickly overrun by skilled enough infantry, or even wiped out by a square formation. Then finally, the fists of your military, the artillery. When used properly and put atop the proper ground, artillery can bloody a foe before they even fire their own first shots. For long distance bombardment, there's round shot. Solid cast iron balls that smash into enemy lines, killing rows of men. When they get closer, explosive shot. Large explosives fired out of a cannon that explode upon impact that can devastate an entire portion of a regiment. And if the enemy breaks through your lines, you'll have to make them wish that they didn't. Canister shot. Working as essentially a large shotgun and fired at close ranges, a canister shot is made up of many smaller iron balls and even items such as pebbles and nails. If rows of men sounds too small for losses, a proper canister volley can obliterate an entire regiment in seconds. Despite such firepower and range, however, a battery left out in the open makes her a good target for vengeful cavalrymen, and with such a demanding reload time and no guarantee of a hit on any specific moment, relying on artillery for a victory is a sharp gamble. An entire army made up of these components is an overall deadly force, and with high enough numbers coupled with the admittedly very generous replenishment system, a single army can fight multiple battles before needing to withdraw to safety. But numbers aren't everything. A battle strain is a very important factor to winning battles. Smaller armies may not have much of a chance defeating larger armies out in an open field. However, hills, mountains, woodlands, and brush offer high ground and better accuracy and even ambush positions. Defensive structures also litter almost any battlefield you'll visit. Stone walls, town halls, barns and homes. Even if a small detachment is hopelessly outnumbered and has no chance of winning, they always have the chance for a last stand that will echo throughout history. If defense structures are properly used, you can inflict losses many times your own before you finally succumb. Or maybe your army is in need of a desperate withdrawal from a battle it can't win, but you need more time than what's been given to you. Your most elite or veteran units set up on power positions may just give you enough time to save everyone else, a sacrifice that will not go in vain. However, we've yet to discuss the bane of any army who stands mere miles away from victory, fortresses. The enemy is at your doorstep, your empire's capital city is on the verge of falling, an entire army charges your walls, or maybe even two of them, but with a force even half their size and class, and with large stone walls to stand atop, maybe you might just not only win such a battle, but obliterate your foe into a rout and across an entire front, until eventually, capitulation. Of course, coveted by any young aspiring dynasty from this time period, overseas territory is a must-have to assert your dominance on the world stage of politics. Being such long distances away, if unable to raise armies on your new lands, you'll need to rely on transporting armies from your old lands. Of course, if you're in a hurry to colonize, you can always load an army onto a single ship, but if another nation decides to interfere, one ship is not much against a whole fleet, an entire army gone in an instant. A major setback. And if your nation relies on trade ports for its income, you'd best hope the AI has something better to do with its fleets than raid your ports. The only way to secure overseas commerce and travel, a grand navy to match any other. There are three types of ports in Empire. Trade ports, dockyards, and fisheries. Trade ports and fisheries are largely economic. Trade ports secure overseas trade with other nations and are vital to a nation's economic growth. And fisheries provide a good steady stream of income, albeit income that can be worth less than what a trade port can potentially offer. While both these ports allow for the building of smaller ships such as sloops, true navies are built up in dockyards. Dockyards allow for the building of raided ships, as well as smaller ships such as galleys and frigates. As your naval technology progresses, your capacity for mightier ships increases. From the small and expendable six-rate ships, to the ginormous and prestigious first-rate ships of the line. The cost and upkeep of four regiments and a painfully long build time, the loss of a first-rate ship is a tragedy, but the damage they'll do all the while more than makes up for it. And as naval tech advances, more historical options become available. Quick and agile steamships, long-range rocket ships, and cannonade frigates. While firepower is important to a quality fleet, speed and maneuverability at sea is important to a fleet's success. And when all seems lost, even at sea, an all-out assault is still a viable option. However, no matter how mighty an army, and no matter how powerful an economy might be, a face-off against a coalition of neighbors is never a good scenario to be in. Any nation, big or small, 
needs friends if it's going to survive. Diplomacy is the art of making these friends, and while Empire's diplomacy system is, admittedly, not the most fleshed out I've ever seen, it certainly does the job. Alliances are key to adding security to your borders. Whether you need a helping hand in defeating a neighbor, or you need to safely move troops from one of your borders to a front line, alliances both keep peace and relieve a bit of tension from the player's mind. Say a nation feels none too kind to you, and you need their support for one reason or another, a gracious donation from one monarch to another may turn a few heads your way. Say a neighbor is in danger of being annexed by a greater power. By becoming your protectorate, you can step in and keep the balance of power in the region, and in exchange for your guarantee, a fraction of their treasury becomes yours every turn. Be careful to keep them close, however, as the war for independence may break out against you. And should they secure alliances with your enemies, a secession crisis may be the downfall of your dynasty. Diplomacy goes beyond making friends, however. Sometimes it's less personal and more business. Coveted provinces, colonies, and tech can all be exchanged for more of the same, or maybe a large quantity of coin. So all's well, right? You have a large military, a supercharged economy, and no one who will challenge you. At times like this, your greatest enemy doesn't reside around you, but within you. Your country is made up of people, and those people need to be kept happy. If we can learn anything from history, an unhappy people leads to a violent conflict. Revolutions, the means by which the lower classes expel the supposedly oppressive upper class. Keep your taxes too high or undermanage your civilian facilities, and your subjects grow ever more impatient. You can have all the land in the world, but rebels prove a versatile and unpredictable foe, able to strike anywhere and at any time. The first strike may even be at the belly of the beast. If your capital falls to them, consider your dynasty rendered to another footnote in history, as a new government rises up to take its place, or as nations once long conquered rise once more, or as your colonies break away to form nations of their own. A game of technology, diplomacy, revolution, and conquest, and some of the best RTS battles you'll find of the golden age of warfare, Empire Total War, is the ultimate video game experience of 18th century imperialism that I've yet seen to be matched. With the scale of an entire world, and the need to make a weighted decision every turn, it's also a good game for keeping the player on edge, and eager just to see what happens next. Empire Total War truly is the 18th century's RTS.